<clears throat> Among our announcements, we're going to have a singspiration tonight. There's been a misprint in this bulletin. The uh, singspiration will start at 6 o'clock, our normal uh, Sunday evening time. Uh, so it's going to be a wonderful service of singing and congregational songs as well as special music. And then on July the 31st, the last Sunday of this month, Tom Shelton will be here in concert. Do want to remind you about the fifth Sunday offering. It will go toward our flood insurance uh, on this building, and uh, the total amount of the offering will go uh, for that. So uh, we always appreciate your generous giving on that particular day. Uh, the peanut butter for Haiti, the current total is 1700 uh, We're about halfway there, so we want to thank everybody for your generous giving in the last little bit in making that possible. <clears throat> Our homecoming will be in August the 28th uh, with Shane Lockard from Zebulon Church as our speaker. Michael, at this time, open our services with scripture and prayer. If you'll stand. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Be reading from John chapter 5, verses 30 through 35. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, how thankful we are to be here this morning, to be able to assemble together and to worship you, Father, in spirit and in truth. God, we're thankful for everyone that's in attendance here today, and thankful that for those who watch us online, and thankful for the te technology that allows that to happen. God, we pray for all those that are sick and afflicted and hurting and in pain and uh, Father, we just pray for each and every one of them that you be with them and through our services, may they be encouraged and strengthened. And God, we're mindful of the, the families that are grieving over a loved one and ask for your comfort and your peace, strength and protection for them. God, we pray for our military men and women and also our missionaries, the police officers, firefighters, first responders. We ask, Father, that you please be with each and every one of them. May you watch over and protect them. Father, we ask that you be with their families as well. God, we pray for the service here at Sharondale this morning, that as your word goes forth, it will strengthen the Christians. It will encourage us. We're thankful for our new brother in Christ. Uh, that the decision he made this past week. And God, we're just so thankful for all that you do for us. We thank you most of all for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. The opening hymn is Mansions Over the Hilltop, all three stanzas. Satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that 
that city where the ransom will shine. I want a gold bond that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old then someday yonder we will never more wander but walk on streets that are pure as gold the often tempted, tormented and tested, and like the prophet, my pillow was stone, and though I find here no permanent I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow. And someday yonder we will never more wander, but walk on streets that are pure as gold. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I discourage I'm heaven bound I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city I want a mansion a robe and a crown I've got a Just over the hilltop In that bright land Where we'll never grow And someday yonder We will never more wander But walk on streets that are pure as gold. If you're visiting with us and wish to partake of the communion with us, uh, there are packets at the front door. If you did not pick yours up and would like to partake this morning, uh, someone will bring it to your seat at this time. Do we have anyone who wishes a communion packet? We'll be singing the breaking of bread, all three verses. Dear Lord, we break the bread in of that great sacrifice on Calvary. This we do each Lord's day as Christ has said, bless all 
disciples now who break the bread. Bless thou the cup, dear Lord, to us this day. May we with hearts prepared His word obey. We now His death proclaim in His own way. Until He comes again, we keep this day. Our Savior now doth reign in heaven above. Death's power he, he overcame such match love to heaven he did ascend there he's enthroned he is our dearest friend for us At this time, Bruce will lead us in our communion service. Good morning. In John, uh, the sixth chapter, uh, starting with the 51st verse, we hear the parable of the, of the uh, bread of life. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. The Jews didn't understand that. They said they strove according to the King James Bible uh, or uh, tried to get their heads together and try to decide what this meant. And they couldn't understand how a man could give his flesh to be eaten. And then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Then we get into Hebrews starting with the uh, second chapter, verse 7. We get to bring the man into the picture. And we see the exaltation of man here. It says, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crowneth him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of, the, of his hands, that has put all things in subjection under his feet. For in, in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Man had dominion over the, over the world, everything that was in it at one time. This means the fish, the birds in the air, all the animals. But... Sin creeped in. 
So it had to be uh, eradicated. So Jesus Christ comes on the scene. In verse 9, it talks about the exaltation of Christ and following from verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of, of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He came here to die for you and me and everybody else. So that was his purpose. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of the salvation perfect through the sufferings. He suffered the death on the cross, the most agonizing death probably known to man. He went through it. For both he, here's the good part. There's always something good that comes out of what Jesus Christ does and, uh, the, and, the, and the God that sent him. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. We're a brethren with Jesus Christ. What a glorious statement that is coming out of the scriptures. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I sing praise unto them? And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children, I and the children which God hath given me. Here's the very good verse in this meditation the 14th verse of second or of second second chapter of hebrews for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood we're flesh and blood he was a spirit that came to earth became man but inside of that man was a deity and he was divine we're neither one so get that out of, your, out of your head. If you think so much of yourself, if you think you're divine, you better check yourself. But he is. And for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same. He took on flesh and blood. And through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. God condemned sin uh, in our bodies through Jesus Christ. And, and he delivered them who, thought, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We are not subject to bondage, bondage now because of what the Lord Jesus Christ done on the cross. We're set apart, sanctified. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He could have came as an angel. He could have done anything he wanted to, but he lowered himself to mankind and took on the seed of Abraham, which is a man. Uh, and therefore, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make re reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted or comfort those that are tempted. Uh, I'd like to touch on a few things here, uh, uh, if time will permit me here. In Romans 8, 3, it says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. And, and in 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed, unto the, believed on in the world, and received up unto glory. So he went through the whole process for you and me. 
And I'd like to touch on his humanity here just for a minute or two. He suffered sorrow in his humanity. I've got the scriptures for it if anybody wants them after the after time don't allow us here this but anyhow he 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 uh, he had natural growth he experienced natural growth he grew from a baby to a man he experienced hunger he had to have sleep He suffered poverty. I think about Pat's fox. He's got a den up there he goes in. But our Lord and Jesus, Savior Jesus Christ didn't have nowhere to lay his head, according to the scriptures. He also suffered, uh, he, he had a physical body, and, and he suffered weariness. All these things made him human, but he was divine. And he had a deity about him, which was instilled in an incarn incarnated man. Uh, Job, uh, a man that uh, believed God and would not back down from it, but he was really wearied. In the 14th chapter of of Job, he said, man born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. So if you're looking for salvation in this world, it ain't here. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 19, it says, uh, if only in this life we have hope in Christ. I'm paraphrasing just a little bit. We're among men most miserable. I've seen a lot of Christian people go through this building just day in and day out, day in and day out. Wearied. And I've heard, I've heard some of them pray that, that, that the Lord would come back today, right now. But they got the reward, and it came uh, after their death, the death of this life. So, uh, you know, it seemed like everybody in here has suffered some kind of sickness at one time or another. And uh, we have a, a large prayer list, different sicknesses. But you know, I don't know of a doctor in this world that can write you a prescription for sin that'll cure that. But I know somebody that can ward it off for you till you, till you leave here. And that prescription is the bread and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you'll expose your bread, I'll have a prayer. Father God, we know that uh, the bread of life came down from heaven, and what a marvelous gift it was, and what a horrendous thing that the Lord Jesus Christ had to go through to eradicate sin. And we know and give thanks for this bread. In Jesus' name, amen. We can partake of the bread. Expose the cup. Father, this uh, fruit of the vine that we're partaking of tells us in Romans 6, 3 that we're baptized into his death like he will be, like he was resurrected the same will, will, will take place with us if we walk in a newness of life and remain faithful unto death. 
will partake of the fruit of the vine. Thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't take too long. But
With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. sermon text for today is Acts 17, verses 22 through 28. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious, for I've walked around and looked carefully at all the objects of your worship. I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God, who made the, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and everything and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed them. Rather, he himself gives everything life and breath and everything else. From one man he created all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and their boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have everything of our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Uh, Shane Stanley, as he was coming into the services, he noticed a black vehicle in the parking lot that has the back hatch open. So if it's your vehicle and you fear that something might be stolen out of it, uh, if you leave it like that, you may want to go out and adjust it. It's in the main end of the parking lot. Also, we had a re special request from Debbie Foley that um, her son-in-law, James Bailey, had a car wreck. Is that correct? All right. All right, so he's an ER, and this is in Tennessee. All right. Also received a special request for Judy Lester, former teacher here uh, in our school system uh, at Belfry, and also Raymond Justice. Um, he was a coach in, uh, here at Belfry for 12 years, and you know his family well. That's Felicia's brother, and um, he's an ICU and hazard. Uh, I saw him last night. He's very, very ill and uh, in a lot of pain and had surgery. Uh, and so uh, we want to remember him as well. I'm going to pray especially for these. Is there uh, anyone else who has an urgent request that you want to make? Go ahead. Oh, what is, what is her name? Say healthy. All right. Yeah. And is she out yet? Are the, okay. All right. And it was her broken hip, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Read as God has. Then it, all right, and she's going to have surgery. I did a lot of painting for Rita Scott. She's a fine person. 
Um, is there anybody else that uh, you want me to mention in prayer? I can't see who. Margaret. Mitchell, all right. Sheila Taylor. She in the hospital now? Okay. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before your presence this morning, we're thankful to be here in your house, uh, to be led in worship by these who read scripture and sang beautiful uh, hymns uh, in praise to you. And we appreciate every prayer and every person who contributed to bringing us closer to you. And we know that we come close to you in our prayer time and we have special needs now of people who have urgent requests. Be with James Bailey as he is in, I, in the Tennessee in the emergency room and is irresponsive. I just pray that he'll be able to, uh, be his health will be able to be restored. We know he's been on a lot of treatments lately. We pray for Judy Lester in Raymond Justice, in ICU, after his very serious surgery. Also be with Faye Helvey, who is in the hospital with a broken hip, that she will heal and return to her home. Bless Brad Mounts, who's been in a lot of pain for uh, several weeks, and due to have surgery soon, I pray that he'll get relief. We pray for Rita Scott, uh, a wonderful teacher in our school system and, and now retired and I pray that you'll bless her as she is going to have surgery for colon cancer. I pray also for Mitchell Stanley and Sheila Taylor and Janet Runyon and uh, all of these need special comfort and healing and we know dear God that you can take care of them, and I pray that you'll bless them and their loved ones. In Jesus' name, amen. For our message this morning, I would like to draw your attention to five calls in the Bible. Four of these we have no control over. One of them, we do. But they're very important because they're life and death situations. First of all, the call of life. We were brought into this world. Of course, we had nothing to do with it. God ordained it. He wanted us to live upon this earth. He chose our parents, and we are here. The call of life is referred to in the book of Acts, chapter 17, in the scripture reading that we already heard from Jason, and I want us to focus on two verses, verses 24 and 25 from this sermon of the Apostle Paul there in Athens, Greece. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, and this is very significant, this verse, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Every day I thank God for every breath that he gives me. I thank him for every morsel of food, and I thank him for every step that I take. Because Paul will say here in this sermon, in him we live 
and move and have our being. So he not only brought us into this world, but he sustains us and takes care of us as well. There's another call that we do not have any control over, and that is if we have a natural death or even an unnatural death if it comes through violence. Sometimes people take their own lives. But death is something that we do not have control over in most situations. It comes usually unexpectedly. Sometimes someone is very, very ill. And because of a diagnosis that a doctor gives, we know that their death is going to be near. But yet then we still do not know. The Hebrew writer said in chapter 9 and verse 27, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. That little word once is very significant. We take it for granted in the Christian faith because we know that when this life is over, the next life that we have is in Christ in heaven with God and all the saints who went on before. But not all religions in the world believe that we die once. There are many religions that believe in what is called reincarnation, that after this life we either come back again as another individual, and in the Hindu religion, maybe even as an animal of some kind. Because they believe that life goes on in various stages after this life. But the writer of Hebrews said, we are destined to die once. And then after that, we will face the judgment. In this section of scripture of Hebrews chapter 9, there are some, there is one word that, that happens there three times in three verses. And that is the word appear as it relates to our Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 9, the word appear is used three times in verses 24, 26, and 28. And it's very, very important to recognize each of these verses. So I want to draw your attention to them as we look at, first of all, verse number 24. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands. Now we call this building here a sanctuary. It is made with human hands. It was built by individuals who were skilled laborers. And the temple in the Old Testament of the scriptures was built by human hands. And there were priests who ministered in that temple. And they offered sacrifices to God. But Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands. That was only a copy of the true one. That was just a, a representation of a true one. The true one is what the rest of the verse says. He entered heaven itself. Heaven is the Lord's sanctuary, is Jesus' sanctuary. And now we see the word appear. Why did he go back, one of the reasons, and appear in the sanctuary called heaven? Now to appear for us in God's presence. Jesus is defending us before the Heavenly Father, even as Satan is accusing us constantly, daily, even as Christians. Trying to get God to realize that we're not true. But Jesus is there appearing for us, even as a lawyer appears for us in court if we need somebody to defend us. But what else does Jesus do here as far as his appearing? Obviously, from verse 26, 
he appeared on this earth to die on the cross for our sins. Notice verse 26. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. This ties so much in with the message that Bruce presented to us today. So he did away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. You see, in the Old Testament, there were sacrifices offered up to God every Sabbath day. Blood was shed. But when Jesus appeared, he was the last sacrifice, the human sacrifice, to do away with sin. And then we notice another appearance of the Lord that we have to constantly remind ourselves of, although we've been reminded of it right here in the communion service. Just by taking it, we're reminded of it. In verse 28, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin. He'll not go to the cross again. He'll not be punished again. He'll not be taken by humans and treated badly again, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Are you waiting for Jesus? If not, today's the day to get your soul fixed, to get your sins removed, so that you can receive this wonderful salvation that he appeared to bring to us. Death is a call that is going to happen, ready or not. But we want everybody to be ready. And in Hebrews, excuse me, in John 5, we see the call of the resurrection. This is something else we have no control over. When God sends Jesus back, one of the things that's going to happen is that there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. This is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, starting with verse 28. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm also going to refer us to verse 29. Our Lord says, do not be amazed at this. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. And those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. The call of the resurrection. It's going to be a wonderful time for the saints. According to what the Apostle Paul wrote in Thessalonians, our Lord will return, and then the righteous will meet the Lord in the air. Their bodies are laid into the earth. They've already, many of them over the centuries, have become just molecules or atoms. But miraculously, when Jesus comes back with the souls of those who had died before, They'll be reunited with their bodies that will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And then we will be carried on with Christ into our heavenly home. So then there's another event we have no control over. God decides when Jesus will return. He decides when our death will be. He decides when the resurrection will be, and he decides when the judgment will be. The Apostle Paul made reference to this in the section of Scripture that Jason read to us in Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. The Apostle Paul said in this great sermon, in, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. And he was talking about the worship of idols and all these other things that humans did and all their sins. 
but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day, we don't know when it is, when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. The man he appointed is the Lord Jesus Christ. We want justice in the world, but we're not going to get it. We hear the whining of children and sometimes even adults. That's not fair. From the time we're little, we whine about injustice. And it's a real thing. That's not fair. It never is. It never will be. But God is. And he's going to give every one of us what we deserve, even if we didn't get fairness in this life. If we got more than our share of pain, if we got more than our share of abuse, if we got more than our share of troubles, it wasn't fair, especially if you're a Christian trying to do right. But God will make it right. The Lord Jesus will make it right. He goes on to say he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. The resurrection is God's proof that we are going to raise from the dead and have a place to live in heaven as well. So the last call, we looked at the call of death, we looked at the call of life, we looked at the call of resurrection, we looked at the call of judgment. The last call that the scriptures referred to is the gospel call. The only one that we have a choice in. When we do it, when we obey, or not obey. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, Paul wrote to the Christians, He called you. Through this, our gospel. Now, many people believe they're called by God for various things. Sometimes they say they're called by God for salvation. Maybe they receive this call through a dream or through a, a terrible event that happened in their lives. But the apostles said that they were called through the gospel. Now, I'm not saying that a, a dream about hell or even heaven may not motivate us to obey the gospel. I'm not saying that maybe a terrible accident or a terrible sickness may not, may not cause us to think about becoming a Christian. I know when I was in high school, I, I had surgery, and I didn't worry about the surgery, but I thought I was going to die from the anesthetic. So they were wheeling me into surgery, and I remember praying a prayer even before I became a Christian, I said, well, God, if you let me through this, let me live through it, I'll become a Christian. I've been thinking about it a long time, but it was something that really made me think about it. But the thing that called me was the gospel. That first time someone told me about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and how I ought to obey it. That is how we're actually called. When the preaching of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. So he called you through this, <clears throat> to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That you might. Not everybody will. Those who listen and accept and have faith and obey, they are the ones who will receive glory because of this gospel. Paul also mentioned what would happen to those who do not obey the gospel of Christ. He talked about this in Thessalonians. So what I want to close with is this. If we are to obey the gospel, we need to know what the gospel is. Now, according to the apostle Paul... In 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 15, it is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
He wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For what I received I pass on to you as of first importance. A lot of important things in this life, but he said this is number one. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Paul said the gospel is the death and burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how can you obey a death, a burial, and a resurrection? You obey the likeness of it. Every one of you did that when you were baptized into Christ. So when you obey the gospel, you're immersed into Christ. That doesn't mean that immersion only saves. Peter did say baptism doth now save us. But not baptism only. Faith saves us, but not faith only. The plan that God established has many facets. It starts out with faith, which is what leads us to all the rest. I mean, without faith, you wouldn't repent. Without faith, you wouldn't confess. Without faith, you would never be baptized. Without faith, you'd never be faithful to the Lord and his church. Without faith, you would not do the things that Christ told us to do in the scriptures to be faithful unto death. It starts with faith. It ends with faith. What have you done in between? You may say, I have faith, but I've not yet been immersed or baptized. I have faith, but I'm not really ready to let go of the bad habits and attitudes and sin in my life. Well, you see, you have to let go of that. That's called repentance. The Old Testament prophets taught repentance. John the Baptist taught repentance. The theme of most of Jesus' sermons was repentance. So that has to be a part of God's plan of salvation. And then we notice in the scriptures that when Jesus, you know, you know, after we heard this little section of scripture for communion that Bruce shared, he shared that scripture on communion about eating the body of Christ. If you would have went on... <clears throat> You would have noticed, but he had to go to other scriptures, of course, but many of his disciples abandoned him after that message. So he asked the question of the disciples, the, the, the 12, he said, are you also going to go? And they said, where else can we go? There's nowhere else to go. And that's when Peter made what we call the good confession. Thou art the Christ, the Son of of the living God. Ethiopian eunuch made a similar statement in the book of Acts. He was riding along in his chariot. He was one of those people that were we would call heathens that actually believed in the Jewish religion. He believed in the one true God. In fact, he went up to Jerusalem to worship during the feast day. And he hadn't yet heard about Jesus. And so, as he was traveling along, God told Philip, a deacon and an evangelist, to join himself with this chariot. And in verse 30, Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. See how religious he was? And he was reading about, in chapter 53, about a prophecy of Jesus. And so 
Philip said to him as he was reading this, do you understand what you are reading? You see, that's so important to understand it. And he said, how can I? Unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. Now notice, notice, think of Jesus with all these words he was reading. But he didn't know it was Jesus. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shear is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Of course, Jesus did not defend himself. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. We don't get justice in this life, I said. He didn't either. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. The good news about Jesus includes baptism into Christ. Because if it didn't, why would the eunuch ask this next question? As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders for the chariot to stop. And you see, they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. But just before that, in the King James translation of the scriptures, which should have been left in this, and was left out because there was, wasn't in all the manuscripts, the oldest manuscripts. But he said, when he asked the question, can I be baptized? And he said, you may if you believe. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. These things happened before baptism. The faith, the repentance, the confession. All this prepares our hearts for this act of baptism. It's important, but it doesn't stand alone. It's connected with all of these other things because sadly, I have baptized, sadly, many in my ministry who felt it was baptism only and did not repent and soon after their baptism went back into the world, into their old ways. It's not faith only. It's not repentance only. It's not confession only. It's not baptism only. It's the whole plan. I don't know where you are on the road. You may have strong faith. You may have already turned your back on sin. Maybe all you lack is your confession and your baptism. If that's what it is, go ahead and do it. And don't put it off because now is the day of salvation. Those are the exact words of scripture. Why don't you come forward at this time as we sing our invitation song if you've not yet obeyed the gospel and make the Lord your savior. Let's be standing please. The first and last stanzas. <clears throat> There's a stranger at the door, let him in, he has been there off before, let him in, let him in ere he is gone, let him in. The lonely one, Jesus Christ, the Lord's Son, let him
Now admit the heavenly gifts Let him in He will make for you a feast Let him in Let him in Sins forgive when earth ties all are real, he will take you home.